As we open up our Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel, we're continuing this series in the book of 1 Samuel. Last week we we studied chapter 8 and we found that in chapter 8, the people of Israel had grown tired of the old administration of God instituting judges and prophets to keep the people on the straight and narrow of the morality that God had issued them in the Sinai covenant. And now the people have called for a centralized administration around a king. They had the desire to be like the other nations and to have a king that could represent them and a, a king that they could follow and, 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 and heed his word. And this displeased the Lord. The Lord said to Samuel that in calling for a king, they're not rejecting you, Samuel as the the judge and the prophet, as much as the Lord says, this is their rejection of me. That Israel was was intended to be a set-apart nation, a unique covenant nation, where God would be enthroned as their king forever. But of course, the people of Israel have rejected that. Now, as the narrative unfolds before us in chapter 9, we kind of see something of of a subplot if you will, and we're introduced to this gentleman's name is Saul, son of Kish. Now this story, this story in chapter 9 seems a little benign. It seems like it doesn't maybe quite fit all of the narrative that we've been reading up until this point, the narrative that ties into the, the nation of Israel and the, and the redemption of God and the person of Christ. This story is going to be about finding some lost donkey. And yet, as they're going out to look for these donkeys, God is going to use this event. God is going to use this episode in the life of this young man named Saul to anoint him as the future king of Israel. We have quite a portion together to read here tonight. I know we delight in the reading of Scripture. I know the Bible tells us in the public assembly to not give up the public reading of Scripture, but this is, I will warn you, quite a lengthy piece of narrative to read, but we will rejoice in this and we will certainly derive the benefit from this reading that God has for us. So let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 9. We're going to pick it up at verse 1 and we're going to read even a few verses into chapter 10. So it is an elongated passage. Let's ready our hearts and our minds to hear God's word to us. 1 Samuel 9, 1. There was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechorath, the son of Aphiar, a Benjaminite, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. For his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Please take one of the servants with you and arise and go look for the donkeys. So he passed through the mountain of Ephraim and through the land of Shalisha, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shalim, and they were not there. Then he passed through the land of Benjamites and did not find them. When they came to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us return, lest my father cease caring about the donkeys and become worried about us. And he said to him, that's the servant says to Saul, Look now, there is in this city a man of God. And he is an honorable man. All that he says surely comes to pass. So let us go there. Perhaps he can show us the way that we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But look, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread in our vessels is all gone. There is no presence to bring the man of God. What what do we have? And the servant said, Saul, again. Sorry, and the servant answered Saul again and said, Look, I have here at hand one-fourth of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. Now, verse 9 is a footnote. It probably is in parentheses in your Bible. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer. For he who now is called a prophet was formerly called a seer. So that's just... That's just an editorial to give you an understanding that we would use the word prophet, but in this day and age in Israel, they were quite fond of the term seer. And so the story continues. Then Saul said to his servant, well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. And they went up the hill to the city 
they met some young woman, some women, sorry, going out to draw water, said to them, is the seer here? And they answered them and said, yes, there he is, just ahead of you. Hurry now, for today he came to this city because there is a sacrifice of the people today on the high place. As soon as you come into the city, you'll surely find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes. Because he must bless the sacrifice afterward those who are invited to eat. Now therefore, go up, for about this time you will find him. So they went up to the city. As they were coming into the city, there was Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people, Israel, that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry has come up to me. So when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, there he is, the man of whom I spoke to you. This one shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, please tell me, where is the seer's house? Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today and tomorrow. I will let you go and will tell you all that is in your heart. But as for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not be anxious about them, for they have been found, and on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and on your father's house? Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of, of Benjamin? Why then do you speak like this to me? Verse 22, now Samuel took Saul and his servant, brought them into the hall and had them sit in the place of honor among those who were invited. There were about 30 persons. And Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion which I gave you, of which I said to you, set it apart. So the cook took up the thigh with its upper part and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, here it is. What was kept back, it was set apart for you. Eat For until this time, it has been kept for you. Since I said, I invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. When they had come down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the top of the house. They arose early. It was about the dawning of the day that Samuel called to Saul on the top of the house saying, Get up, that I may send you on your way. And Saul arose, and both of them went outside, he and Samuel. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And he went on. But you stand here a while that I may anoint, I may announce to you the word of God. Chapter 10, verse 1, the narrative continues. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance. When you have departed from me today, you will find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin at Zelzar, and they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found, and now your father has ceased caring about the donkeys and is worried about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Then, verse 3, you shall go on forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. There, three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you have come there to the city... There you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, tambourine, flute, and harp before them. And they will be 
prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. You will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. At that point, we'll leave off the narrative because we want to leave something for next week in this great story of the calling of the King of Israel, who is Saul. It is it's a peculiar story. It's a story that just feels like the mundane, ordinary daily life of people in Israel. And yet as the story begins to escalate to its high point, its peak, we see Samuel comes good with a flask of oil, drenches the head of Saul, kisses him, and declares over him not only that he will be the anointed commander of the people of Israel, but that the Spirit of God shall come upon him and he will prophesy. This narrative which we have to break up over a couple of weeks and come back next week to study more regarding Saul's calling, Saul's filling by the Spirit, and even Saul's prophesying. We'll reserve our thoughts here tonight to speak of the man who was pursuing his donkeys and would be made king. I don't know, maybe, maybe if I was one of those preachers that put a lot of stock in pithiness, I might call this sermon tonight. I'm not going to, but I might call it the, the donkey king. I won't, of course. That's, that would be silly indeed. But here is Saul of a very wealthy family. We saw later on in chapter 9, Saul downplays his family. But the opening of chapter 9 already reveals to us that Kish was a man of valor. Kish was a man of means. Kish was wealthy. And not only was Kish someone to be reckoned with as far as his financial success was concerned, but we also learn that Saul was no shrinking violet. I don't know if that term or that phrase is used much here uh, in Texas, but that's a common phrase in Australia. A shrinking violet was someone who maybe was short of stature and reserved of personality. Saul was not that way at all. He was head and shoulders above the rest. He was a foot taller than all else in Israel. He stood apart. Now here's the reality that as we, as we enter into chapter 9 and we realize the people have demanded a king, that's what they've required. And so now we have a period of uncertainty and indeed instability. God has been rejected as the king over Israel and now a plan of succession must be instated. And those of us that have studied any history at all and know something about royal successions, particularly in the ancient world, know that these times were times of grave instability. Many people lost their lives for no other reason, but they were born into the wrong family with the wrong last name and at a time where the heir to the throne was not so apparent. This is the situation that arises in our story here this evening. And the story in chapter 9, insofar as how it opens up, is a strange story that sets in stone a reality that although the people want a king, they've explicitly asked for a king, it's going to come about in a very bizarre way indeed. The Bible, surely you know this by now, the Bible doesn't read like a Hollywood blockbuster movie. The Bible's not written to break bestseller records. It has done. And many movies that have been made on the stories of the Bible have indeed been Hollywood blockbusters. But that's aside, that's not the way this book is written or presented to us. Nor is the Bible overtly trying to retain your attention. We can read a large swath of scriptures we've done together this evening. And without asking for a response from my audience here tonight... I'm sure more than one of us at different times in that story had to refocus and zero in upon the text and follow the story as it's easy for our minds to wander when stories like this seem to relay mundane affairs. So there's a guy named Kish. He lost some donkeys. He went to his son, his capable son, his able son, his tall and fit son and says, grab a servant and go look for my donkeys. This would have been an everyday affair of people in the days of Israel. It's not trying to retain our interest by carefully retelling stories in a manner suited to impress. This is real human history. What confronts us time and time again when we open up our Bibles and we read our Bibles is these are real events that happen in real time space. These are real moments in real human history. Not, not dressed up, 
not full of the dross and the wordiness of great historians and storytellers. These are the facts. This is real human history. We are tracing the real movements of a sovereign God throughout this fledgling empire of Israel. So, it starts out with this premise, some donkeys go missing. Now at that point, although I can emphasize that as as best as possible, maybe even try and contextualize that as as best as I may, the story is just simply the, the household pet got out of the gate and the son sent to find him. It's not that unusual an affair, even in our own day and age. But yes, this is where the Bible brings our attention to see God working ever in the mundane of life, bringing about eternal ramifications and literally writing his story of redemption in human history in the mundane. Never despise the mundane. Never despise small things. So... Some donkeys go missing. Now, as we've already learned, Kish was kind of, a, kind of a big deal. Kish had a lot of money. If you're using the English Standard Version tonight, it will literally say he was wealthy. If you're using the, uh, an older translation, which of course you notice that, that I am, you'll actually read that he was a, a mighty man. He was a, a man of bravery and valor and, and a man who was well known. Kish was kind of a big deal. His son who isn't going to run second in the family, let me restate that, he has a son who is as far as, as far as beautiful, good looking, handsome, fit young men go, Saul's not going to run second in the local county beauty pageant. Saul, the son of Kish, who's wealthy, a man of means, and Saul himself is an imposing stature of a man. And Saul is going to leave home as a donkey tracker, and return, he's going to return home as the spirit-empowered king of all Israel. You could argue, maybe, there's something of a Cinderella story in this, and perhaps that kind of an argument would, would have some cogency to it, but the point we want to labor here together this evening is God is always working in our lives, in the mundane of our life, in the seemingly inconsequential of our life, to bring about His eternal purpose of redemption. Now, there's a note of the ordinary. I tried to labor that and impress that upon you. As we see so many times in history, here is the rub. Large doors of history have always turned on the smallest hinges of what seems pure coincidence. We see this even in the life of Christ. The life of Christ. At the time that God will send forth His only begotten Son, Jesus, to be born of the virgin woman, Caesar Tiberius has called for, by by royal imperial decree, he's called for all of his subjects to be counted in an empire-wide census. And the timing could not be more perfect. As Mary and Joseph return to Bethlehem to give birth to Jesus. And the story, as you hear it, Christmas after Christmas after Christmas, is that the God-man, the creator of all reality, the Logos of God, will be born in an animal stable. It's, it's innocuous. It's benign. It's mundane. It's seemingly coincidental. But here it is to God, to God, There are no accidents or coincidences. And God is always working through the seemingly mundane aspects and events of our lives to bring about His eternal kingdom and His glory. Of course, we all feel like, we all perhaps feel like, our story could be effortlessly turned into a Broadway musical, right? Don't put up your hand. Your life, the next Hamlet. But here's the reality. And although we may want to embellish, and we're all prone to do that, we're all prone to retell accounts and retell stories of our own life and our own experience in, in ways that always just somehow embellish our role. 
We're, we're all prone to retell stories and accounts and narratives of, of our own life after the fact to, a, to an audience that we've wooed with our regalia of our story. We've, we've always been prone to be able to make ourselves look a little more, more heroic, a little more involved, a little more glorious. I love this about the Bible. I love that when we come to the Bible, it just, without apology, cuts through all of the self-glorification that we are all prone to. Here it is. Saul accidentally stumbles upon Samuel as a donkey tracker. Now, God has already prepped Samuel. God has already prepared Samuel to be anticipating the arrival of the soon-to-be king of Israel. But all Saul knows is he spent three days tracking these donkeys to no success at all. He's run out of food and he's ready to pack up his bags and go home. And in comes this servant. Now you have to realize this servant really is the hero of this story. We're going to spend a bit of time in just a moment looking more at the involvement of this servant in the story of Saul being anointed king of Israel. But let's spend another few moments on this main point. If I could read you Proverbs 16, 9, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. There are no coincidences. Little inconveniences are no coincident to a sovereign God. Trust him. What does this mean? It means trust him. Trust him. Be open. Be even more than that, be, be anticipating how a mild or major inconvenience in your life can be turned by God into something glorious for someone else or even your own story. Trust Him. And because we're trusting Him, right, the, the tire blows out on the road, we're going to pull over and we're going to be late, we're going to miss an appointment, all our plans are now in disarray and we're so prone to look heavenward and say, God, how could you let this happen? And the Lord wants to say to us and does say to us through scripture, do you trust me? I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm aiming at. I know what I'm bringing about seems to you like an inconvenience, like a coincidence, but trust him. Let me offer one more point of application before we move on and talk about the hero of this story, which really is the servant. If we're trusting God through those minor or major inconveniences of our life, then let's work hard to not make frustration our immediate knee-jerk reaction. Let's not do that. Now here the contrast in the story is, is poised before us, Saul and servant. You never learn this servant's name. You never find out who this guy is. But his role in this story is fairly staggering not to overstate it. Saul says, I'm done. We're out of food. I'm sure my dad's more worried about me than he is of these donkeys. I'm tired of looking. I've had enough of this. Let's just, let's head on home. And the servant arises and says, have we consulted God have we, have we involved God at all? Now again, sometimes as we, as we reflect upon our real human nature, we're not trying to gloss over it here tonight. We're trying to be plain, honest, and direct about this. Sometimes frustration is the knee-jerk reaction because we've grown quite a savor and a relish for the feeling of being sovereign over our life. And as Christians, there's nothing that could be more antithetical to the humility that Christ calls of us inconveniences will come. Let's work hard to not allow our knee-jerk reaction to be frustration or quitting. Well, I don't know where God is in all this. Let's go home. I don't know how many times in your life you've come to that juncture. I come fairly often. And maybe it's not a servant, I don't have servants, of course, but maybe, maybe it's not someone next to me saying, hey, maybe we should pray, but maybe it's the spirit inside of me that says, have you yet, up until this point, involved God in this whole equation? And so the servant, the servant arises. Now, up until this point in the story, the servant's not been mentioned. I mean, we know that Saul took a servant with him on the hunt for the donkeys, but now when Saul's at his most 
at his point of, of, of greatest frustration and ready to quit and resign the whole affair, the servant rises up and says, let's go and consult the Lord. In this town, there's a prophet. There's a seer right here in this town. It'd be the easiest thing in the world, Saul. Let's just, let's just go and ask him. He's been known to be accurate, to be precise. He's been known to know the Lord. Now you start to think to yourself, that's a compelling way to convince Saul to do so. But here's the reality for you and I as we continually try and take this story and make it touch down into the reality of our life that for you and I, it's the simple bowing of a knee to seek the Lord. God, why do you want this to happen? Why do you want this inconvenience? Why do you, why do you bring this tragedy into my life? Why, why this loss? Why this frustration? I'm ready to give up. I'm ready to quit. You've heard me quote this before. I don't know how many times I've said it. I love this phrase because it, it so best defines Western Christianity. I don't know who first said it, but an author that I enjoyed reading said that the modern Western Christian is one flat tire away from rank atheism. Driving along, car starts to shudder, you pull over, the tire's flat. Well, there is no God. How does that happen? The servant imposes upon Saul, we must go consult the prophet. He can speak into our situation, speak a word of clarity into our circumstance. Seek God, godly counsel. Now in this instance, Saul's first, Saul's first protest is, we've got nothing to set before the seer. And again, that's where we get the clarification in the story that in that day and age, as it has been in all day and age of God's servants, they must dedicate their life to the service of the Word of God. Now, there are circumstances where the prophet of God, the Bible teacher, the pastor of the local church is not able to dedicate himself vocationally to his service. But thankfully, that is the norm. Scripture requires it to be so. As Scripture encourages us, those that labor in the word over you are worthy of double honor. Do not muzzle the ox while it treads out grain. It's true of the prophet here in 1 Samuel. Saul says, we can't just turn up and say, hey, prophet of God, come up with a prophecy. Help us out. Where are these donkeys? Are they, are they dead? Are they forgotten? Are they lost? Or are they nearby? And Saul says, we can't just come empty-handed. This is where I love this servant. This servant doesn't say to Saul, well, here's how this works, Saul. I am but a poor servant. And Saul, your dad, well, he the rich man. He's got all the money. I'm carrying on me a coin, a single coin. Now, I'm willing to lend this to you at fairly steep interest if you're entering into a contract with me. The servant volunteers freely of his resource. I love that. The servant doesn't allow the protest of Saul to get into the way of clearly God's divine plan. He says, I'm willing to volunteer and offer my resource. I'm willing to make a sacrifice. I'm willing to let this cause me loss because this is the way that God would have us go. Of course, they go to Samuel. God has already prepared Samuel. At no time in the story do we ever read that Samuel actually takes the money. He would have been entitled to do so, but he doesn't. And in the converse, he makes sure that these men are very well fed at a feast. There's a, whole, there's a whole sermon in that, isn't there? That often we come to God with our little, with our small, with our meager. And don't we act like we're really giving over the whole bank, don't we? God, I'm going to bring this, but oh, I hope you know what this cost me. And every time we come to God, and every time we sacrifice for God, and every time we're willing to be impoverished for the cause and the kingdom of God, the Lord finds a way every time and in every circumstance to ensure that we are more than enough well taken care of. Samuel's been prepared, hasn't he? The Lord spoke to Samuel, said, tomorrow you're going to meet the man. You're going to anoint him with oil. He's going to become king. And you're going to have a hand in his ordination and coronation. The upshot of all this as the story unfolds, as we've read it now and we have a, a bare understanding of these historic events, the application becomes all the more clear to us. Hey, here it is on a platter 
for us all, be the servant. He's the man of this story. He's the hero of this story. Not even Samuel the prophet. Not Saul, the soon-to-be king, head and shoulders above all Israel. It's this unnamed, unknown, willing to sacrifice servant. Be the servant. Be the servant. What did the servant teach us? Firstly, seek God and seek godly counsel before quitting anything. Oh, that we would learn this lesson. How many more grand and glorious objectives would we as the church and and us each as individual Christians accomplish for the kingdom of God if we employ just that one rule? If we go away from here tonight, learn and listen to nothing else than just this rule, pursue God, seek God before you quit anything, what a staggering difference this would make to our lives. We're so prone to quit. And part of it is because we, we enter into objectives for the Lord with an with a ready-made idea of how everything's going to fall into place. How everything's going to go. How each event is going to, is going to sequentially occur and, and each result is going to happen the way that we want it to happen. And we're, we're, so, we're so unable to include in our planning. Now, to be sure, we must plan, but to include in our planning this supernatural element of God's intervention. Before you quit anything, seek God. The most, the most glorious thing the servant did in this whole story is say to Saul, before we give up, let's consult the prophet of the Lord. Secondly, and perhaps equally importantly, although I made that first point a really big point, equally importantly, relish a willingness to not have to be the hero of your story. I, I, I don't know who this servant is. I don't know how long he lived. I don't know if he reappears in Scripture somewhere else and and next time his name is known and he's spoken about. Or I don't know if this is the only time ever in his life that he he emerged onto the scene of redemptive history in Israel and God used him for this one thing. And I don't know whether he ever was able to read this account of the story and he, he scratched his head and he thought, well, they could have at least put my name, Right? This is an encouragement for us. Let me state it as clearly as I've tried to labor to state it time and again. The hero, the hero of the entire Bible is always Jesus. And the hero of your life will always be Jesus. Find a relish in that. I'm not asking you tonight, I'm not asking us tonight to just be okay with that. That's not what I'm proposing. I'm saying... Generate a delight in that proposition. That through all your life, all your planning, all your desiring, the using of your gifts and the sacrifices that you make for the kingdom, seeking first the kingdom and desirous above all that Christ would be magnified and the hero of every story. And so following on from that point, make it all about your king. Your story finds value in being part of Christ's story. That's why this servant is named at all. The only reason this servant is named is because he has a a close proximity and association with Saul, the soon-to-be king. Now, Saul becomes, spoiler alert, block your ears, if you don't know how 1 Samuel's going to unravel, Saul becomes a train wreck. And yet, this servant finds his value and being part of that bigger story. How has your life built the kingdom of Christ? When the history of redemption is wrapped up and retold for all eternity, how much of a role have you played? How how feverish are we to to be the centerpiece of our life and the, the point of glory and the point of celebration? Now, maybe you might think, well, I don't feel like a significant player. Do you think this servant did? Maybe you feel like, well, I can't have any real impact. I'm not ordained to teach the Bible or stand in front of churches or go to distant mission fields. That's just really not my lot in life. Does it seem like that was this servant's lot in life? This servant 
His story, his contribution is etched infallibly for eternity in the very Word of God. There's going to come a moment when we're all in glory, and by God's grace we all get to glory because we have found our salvation exclusively in Christ. We're going to be in glory, and we're going to bump into someone who's going to say, you actually, you know me, but you don't know I'm the guy. Have you read my story? Have you read what I did? What God used me to do? No glory to me, no celebration or aggrandizing of me, but have you heard how the king used me? My prayer is that we can all reply and say, we did know. We studied one night in church in our first Samuel sermon series. We spent a whole period of a message looking at how we can be like you. And then your reply can be, have you seen what the Lord used me for? Have you been useful for the king? Without seeking your glory, your story, your heroism to be retold, do you have a part to play? Maybe you feel insignificant. Maybe you feel like, well, the the big ministry really needs to be reserved for the professionals. Here we have a servant. What a great lesson this is for all of us. No name. No career prospects, and yet his value was in casting the attention of others back to the Lord. With God, I'll close on this point this evening. With God, your impact, no matter who you are, where you are, what your level of education or expertise or whatever it may be, with God... Your impact can literally be eternal, especially as you seek a simple childlike faith and obedience, a willingness to consult God, a willingness to sacrifice, a willingness to go the extra mile, and above all, a willingness to be forgotten for the sake of Christ. What a great story! This tiny little mention of this servant is within the broader story of Saul and Samuel. Now, there's so many things we could speak on in this, and I said I'll close on that point, and I I mean that in sincerity. There's so many things in this story that, that will be concepts and ideas that will feature later on. One of the most grim of them all, as I whet your appetite for the future expositions of 1 Samuel, is this statement that the people wait for the prophet before they sacrifice and consume the meal. And as this narrative of 1 Samuel unravels before us, we'll see that will be the great undoing of Saul the king and impatience to wait on God. Would you bow your head and close your eyes as we seek God's grace upon this word here this evening. We study scripture. We ask God to make his word light and life to us and to cause it to bear fruit in our lives. Let's seek the Lord's grace here this evening. Father God, we thank you for this privilege we have this evening to sit under the exposition of your word, to heed your word, to hear your word, faithfully exposited. Lord, I plead with you tonight. May may what I have done be anything remotely close to a faithful exposition, that the people may hear your voice, the people may know your word, and may understand what is becoming of them, what is binding on them, how you are calling them to a deeper relationship with you through Christ. Father, help us to ever remember that Christ is the hero of every story, even our story. And if we can play some small part in the extension of his kingdom, the coming of his reign and his glory, the proclamation of his gospel, I pray we would do that with the same attitude we see in this servant of our story tonight. Bless this word to us. Lord God, may all of us grow ever closer to Christ through our understanding of these Old Testament texts. May it be food for us. May it bear fruit in our life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.